and we welcome you from wherever you are joining us from. Um, good afternoon or morning or evening, as we always have to say, as we are uh, globally welcoming you uh, from the Fossey family. I'm Sherry Henning, Chief Advancement Officer of the Fossey Fund, and we wanna thank you for taking the time to join us for today's Conversation in Conservation, uh, What's New in Gorilla Research, hosted by our great team of gorilla experts, our very own president and CEO and chief scientific officer, Dr. Tara Stowinski. And joining her is our Rwanda researcher manager, Dr. Winnie Eckert, and postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Robin Morrison. I'm not exactly sure of the exact number, um, but I think Tara will probably be able to clarify it, but it's safe to say it's well over 50 years of studying these amazing animals between all of them. Uh, so I hope you're uh, ready for a wonderful experience and some great information about these beautiful animals that we continue to uh, protect across the Fosse team. Uh, we continue to develop ways to bring our work to the forefront of those who, that make it possible. You are very generous donors. Um, these conversations are just one way that we do it. And we welcome your feedback as to other ways you would like to learn more about um, our work and the pillars of our work that are so important um, to carrying out our mission. So please let us know um, if we're hitting the marks or if you'd like to hear from us in other ways. A couple of housekeeping notes. Again, uh, everybody is muted um, and uh, obviously we're dealing with technology. Uh, Winnie and Robin are uh, joining us from abroad in different spaces and we will try to make sure that nothing um, hinders us from uh, getting our uh, great webinar to you. But just in case uh, this is being recorded and will be sent out to all of you um, in a link after um, we are finished so that uh, you can view it or send it off to others that may enjoy it as well. Um, also, we'll be doing questions and answers at the end of it and uh, would love to hear from you if something sparks your interest and you'd like to ask a question later, um, please put it in the uh, chat and we will get to as many as we can. And we know that some of you have um, sent in uh, questions beforehand as well. We'll get to as many of those as we can too. Um, so with that and everything covered, I'm gonna turn it over to the real expert, our president and CEO and chief scientific officer, Dr. Tara Stowinski. Tara? Thank you so much, Sherry, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. We're thrilled to have you. And sorry, I'm just getting the technology up and running here. Um, I want this, there we go. Uh, we're thrilled to have you and so excited to, to bring Drs. Winnie and Robin to tell you a little bit about the research that we're doing, which as you know, that's one of our four main pillars and really kind of our roots because Diane Fossey originally was hired to go to Rwanda to study the mountain gorillas. But we, before we dive into the topic for today, I just wanted to provide a few quick updates. So this lovely photo here is of Karudi and our newest infant that was born in Rwanda. Rwanda and we just love him or her because that hair is something else. Uh, but Karudi, this is Karudi's second infant. Her first is Matchabiri, who you probably have heard about if you follow us on social. So Matchabiri was named after Diane Fossey. She's also the granddaughter of the very famous Titus. So this young gorilla is joining an incredibly prestigious family within the Fossey Fund history and we're very excited to see him or her grow up. We don't know the gender yet um, and be able to interact and for Matchabiri to have a younger sibling. Other updates from Rwanda. This is literally a picture that I got in from the field yesterday. So this is the continued building of our new home, our Ellen campus. And as you can see, the buildings are really starting to take form. We've got the Sandy and Harold Price Research Center here in the front. We have uh, the Robin Melanie Walton Education Center and then the Cindy Broder Conservation Gallery in the back. And we've just finished the second story on that. So we are thrilled that this project continues to move forward despite the challenges that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought. And many of you I know have, have signed on to join this project by becoming a Gorilla Champion. We are about to close out that campaign. So if you are interested in having a plaque on the campus, please let us know as soon as possible. We'd love to have you as part of our new home and our future. Uh, turning to the Congo side, we've had a lot of questions recently about the eruption of Mount Nirangongo, Mount Nirangongo which is a volcano that's just over the border from Rwanda. 
This last erupted in 2002 and um, went into the city of Goma, which is a city of about 2 million people and caused incredible problems. Luckily, it did not spread as far this time. You can see this photo on the right, actually. This is the lava flow. So it did go through communities. Um, so it did have a major impact, but it did not make it to the city itself. I'm pretty sure this is the airport here you can see. So you can see how close it made it to the airport. Um, over on the left-hand side of my screen, you can see these mountains in the background. Uh, this is the lava flow coming through through one of the towns, this is a house and this is lava. And this is actually the Virunga volcano. So this is where the mountain gorillas live. So very, very close. Again, luckily no gorillas were affected, but we think of all the people in Congo that were affected. And we did actually have to evacuate our team from Goma. We have a small team in Goma that, that heads up kind of our administrative side of our program in Congo. Where we work in Congo is much further to the west. It's about a two hour flight. So those gorillas were fine, but we hope that this will settle down a little bit moving forward. One of the after effects of the volcanic uh, eruption was earthquakes though, and our teams in both Rwanda and Congo were experiencing upwards of 100 earthquakes a day. And this is a video of the bachelor group that recently formed that we're studying. This is not during one of the earthquakes, but I just thought it was a great video to show. And one of the stories that we heard from our teams is they were out with the bachelors and the bachelors were resting. And while they were resting, an earthquake occurred and the bachelors all looked up and then they looked over at the trackers as if to say, you know, what is happening here? This is not a normal occurrence. So I just thought that was a, an interesting anecdote for, for you to know about what's happening with the gorillas. But again, luckily they're all safe and our teams are as well. The last thing I wanted to mention before we get to our program is some very exciting news that just came out yesterday. Our colleagues at the Wildlife Conservation Society published an updated survey of Grower's gorilla population. So again, these are the gorillas that we work with in Congo. They're critically endangered. And a paper that came out about seven years ago suggested that we had lost 80% of them in a single generation, so a roughly 20 year period. One of the biggest challenges we have with Grower's gorillas is actually estimating their numbers because they occur over a huge range and much of this area is controlled by rebel groups so you can't actually go in and do surveys. So at the time we thought that roughly 80% of the population had, had um, been lost and the numbers were hovering around 3,800 individuals. The numbers that came up now have estimated that the population now stands at just under 7,000. Now this isn't because the population has increased in size but rather because we've gotten better data from some areas that weren't able to be surveyed before. So over Overall, that's great news because it means we just are starting from a higher number of individuals. When you get down to just several thousand individuals, it's always of great concern. Um, what we do know though from their study also is that they are declining. So now we estimate that instead of that roughly 77 to 80% decline in a generation, we've seen about a 60% decline. So still a lot of concern for Grower's gorillas. But again, the good news is that their numbers are slightly higher than we had thought just a few years ago. So with that background, what I'd love to do now is bring on our two guests, um, Winnie and Robin. I have had the pleasure of working with Winnie for almost 20 years. Robin is a newer addition to our team. She joined us just over two years ago. And so we're gonna walk through today a little bit of their background and then talk about some of the research that's happening, mostly with the gorillas. So Winnie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You have, as I just mentioned, worked with us for close to 20 years. And I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your start with the Fosse Fund. Thanks, Tara. So yes, I study biology in my hometown Leipzig in Germany, which is written on the shirt I'm wearing on this photo. And at this time, Leipzig developed to a global hotspot for primatologists, which was a great stepping stone to work and to walk towards and to live my dream to work with great apes in their natural habitat. And I guess as often in life, some fortunate coincidences opened up the unique opportunity to move to Rwanda and to work with the mountain gorillas and the Fossil Fund in 2004. That's also when this photo was taken. And um, yeah, on the right to, uh, on, on my right, you see Felix uh, Nachimana, who's our first Rwandan country director. And he joined about the same time I arrived the first time in Rwanda. So we start exploring gorilla life together. And my family, I guess for them, I always have been a very crazy uh, biobantam and they had to print this on a shirt before my first trip to, uh, to Rwanda. 
And the boots you see on uh, this slide uh, remind me in one of the first unexpected challenges I faced when I arrived in Rwanda and started my field work. Because it soon turned out that uh, walking in the forest without boots is not a good idea. But finding a shoe size, a boot size uh, that fits me in Rwanda was impossible. So technically, I had to uh, learn walking again with a three to four size uh, larger boot size uh, walking up and down those mountains. And uh, Tara, if you go next. Yeah, Winnie, I do have to just interrupt you here for one second, just to tell the, uh, the people that are with us that I love this story. And I actually first heard it when Winnie put the slides together because Winnie is famous among our teams for how quickly she walks. They even have their own nickname for her because she's such a fast walker. And knowing now that she was originally doing it in boots that were two or three times her foot size to me is just, it's just phenomenal, Winnie. Um, it's down. <laughs> <laughs> so here you go, next slide. Thank you. So uh, like every field research assistant, first I had to learn to identify over 100 gorillas, and which we usually do by drawing uh, nose prints of the gorillas, which are unique like human uh, fingerprints. And that can be quite a big challenge uh, in a group like Pablo with over 50 gorillas uh, in 2004. But soon we knew every single gorillas by heart like our human friends. You go next, Tara. That is another photo that uh, captures a moment very early uh, when I arrived in Rwanda, the early years. And it was a very cold and rainy day in Pablo. And I was introduced that day to one of our silverbacks who loves rain ponchos. I didn't know that, but he just simply can't pass you without tracking you for a little, little slide tour through the forest. And um, I think you can see still the surprise in my face. <laughs> Um, thanks, Tara. That's great. Yeah, so Winnie, thank you so much. We're going to talk a little bit more about your PhD in a moment, which you did with us. But first, I want to turn to Robin. So Robin, you are a bit newer to the gorilla scene. So I'd love it if you tell us a little bit about how you got into this field. Yes, yeah. So like Winnie, I also did a biology degree. I did a lot of work on butterflies and fruit flies and even some some genetics and viruses, but the whole time in my degree, I really wanted to study primates and especially apes. So as soon as I finished, I headed off straight to the forest um, and I got a job in Republic of Congo habituating gorillas. So this isn't the Congo that we work in with the grouse gorillas. This is the one a little bit further west um, where there's a lot of western lowland gorillas. So uh, my first job was habituating a group of western lowland gorillas. Um, and they're a little bit less friendly than mountain gorillas in general, that's the, the scientific uh, terminology. Uh, they take a little bit longer to get used to humans. So it can take up to five years to get them used to humans. So I spent six months of my life just following this one group around, trying to win them over, um, trying to get them to essentially not run away from us. Um, and this gorilla on the left is my all time favorite gorilla. Uh, he's called Faunus. And he was the only one in the group that would let us um, approach. He was the only one that would kind of come out and peek at us while we sat there. And so gradually over six months, I got to know this whole group through the eyes of Faunus. So I get to know kind of the friends that he'd play with sometimes and eventually his mom would come out. And finally we got to see the whole group and it was amazing, but such a slow process. Um, and so that was kind of, my my first experience of working with gorillas a very slow one of gradually winning them over um, but yes after that um i'd just fallen in love with gorillas i was hooked and so i started my phd at the university of cambridge and this was actually really wonderful because it's somewhere that Diane Fossey also did her PhD. So at Cambridge, there's a whole bunch of different colleges. So there's about 20 different colleges um, and each one is quite small. So there's maybe kind of 500 students and Darwin College is the college I went to and also the one that um, Diane Fossey went to. So we have a nice little connection there. Although apparently by all reports, she did not enjoy any of her time at Cambridge um, because it was time away from the gorillas. Um, I quite enjoyed it, although I did also have a lot of fun um, out in the field with the gorillas too. Love that you're part, you're definitely part of primatology history because didn't Jane Goodall work there as, do her PhD there as well? So she did her PhD at the college just up the road, but apparently spent a lot of time in, in Darwin because it has the best bar. Um, <laughs> she's now, she's now a, an honorary research fellow at Darwin as well. So I think, I think she was a big fan too. 
Wonderful, great. Well, Robin, your experience working with, there are very few sites where you can actually study Western lowland gorillas. You told us about how difficult that can be, but I know that you worked at several sites for your PhD and under some really challenging conditions. So I wonder if you could tell folks a little bit about that. Yes, yes. So the first place I worked was in Gaga Research Site. So this was also where I've been habituating that group. But for my PhD, we did a big project using camera traps, so automated cameras that gorillas set off when they walk past. You can see that a little bit on the photo on the left. It's me and my research assistant setting up the cameras. And so we'd use these to essentially spy on all of the different groups. So not just the ones we'd painstakingly habituated, but also all the other groups that were using the area. And so that was really exciting. Uh, but if you go to the ne next slide, you'll see a little bit of a, a behind the scenes shot there. So, so at the first, we put all these cameras out around the research site where we, you know, we could sleep in our nice beds and, and wake up and, and travel to the cameras and check them and come back. And eventually we wanted to expand further and further. And so we had to kind of essentially start camping in the forest and searching for new places to put these cameras out. Um, and this is one of our, our, I guess our satellite camps. We'd put them up for a couple of days, but you can see um, my my amazing research assistants made benches and tables out of out of um, branches. But you can see it's a slightly haphazard washing line, and this is where we were living. But it was an amazing experience, kind of camping in the forest and hearing kind of chimp pant hoops at night, and kind of really feeling part of the forest. Um, but also pretty pretty intense. We got attacked by a lot of bees, a lot of ants, um, and it was always a bit of a relief to home to the research site after that. So that was one of the places I worked. Um, the other place was Mbeli Bai, which is an incredibly beautiful place um, and really unusual in studying uh, gorilla behavior because instead of following the gorillas, the gorillas come to you. So it's this big swampy forest clearing in, in the middle of a dense forest that opens out into this big clearing and, and there's elephants that come and visit and gorillas and buffalo and so it's amazing. We kind of sit at the edge and we watch all of the animals that come into it. Um, but again, it's quite interesting behind the scenes. So we are essentially living in this tree house um, and we put uh, tents up on these platforms. So we'd sleep on these platforms overnight and in the morning we'd wake up at about 6 a.m. and come up and try and make our breakfast before any animals arrived. And then as soon as animals arrived, we had to ID everyone. The elephants were particularly early, they'd always be there before breakfast. And we go, oh no, I must ID all the elephants before I can eat any food. Um, the gorillas much better, they arrive at about 8 a.m. Um, and so we'd get to see some really interesting behavior that goes on in these forest clearings. Um, because there's so much food, gorillas will travel from quite a long way to come and visit. And it also means that multiple groups visit at the same time and we get to see those interactions going on. So this picture is actually three different um, Western lowland gorilla groups all interacting and kind of mingling in, in the bay together, which was just fascinating and something that's really rare to see in the forest. That's great. Yeah. And it, I think it's a great um, precursor for the work that you also are doing with us, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But one question, Robin. So how long would you be on that platform? Like how, what was your stint on the platform before you would get to sort of leave? Oh, so I lived on the platform for three months, um, which was great. intense. Three, three months. <laughs> I sometimes leave at the weekends for a couple of days. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty hardcore, especially because you couldn't leave the platform at night because there's a lot of elephants in the forest. It's quite risky moving in the forest at night, especially on your own. And so we'd kind of just be stuck on this platform. It was almost like um, living in space where you kind of can't, can't go outside, can't travel, um, but, but incredible, right? So a very, very strange, but wonderful experience. <laughs> Fabulous. Wonderful. Thanks so much. So Winnie, let's talk a little bit about your PhD, which you did with the Fosse Fun. So you came as a research assistant and I guess loved it so much that you decided then you were going to continue working and do your PhD with the mountain gorillas. Absolutely. Um, that was exactly what went through my head. And from uh, 2006 to 2010, I studied the relationship between the mountain gorilla mothers and their offspring. And my PhD built on the work of my supervisor, Alison Fletcher from the University of Chester, which you see on the photo. And she also conducted her PhD with the very same mountain gorilla population in Rwanda in the early 1990s. And she focused on social development. Next. And we were interested in what distinguished gorilla moms that provide a lot of care from those moms who push their youngsters early into independence. So the two mothers you can see on this photo 
um, there's Metimbeli on the left and Tamu, they grew up together in public group. And they also gave birth for the first time within a few weeks. And those two females, they could have not been more different in their role as a mother. Um, by Metimbeli left her boy very early unobserved with others. Tamu rather hovered over her girl for a very long time. And as a result, the boy became a little superstar in the group with an incredible confidence at a very early age, while the girl scored very high on the scale of fear. If you go to the next, here we have another example, that's Bukima, and she's an example for a highly tolerant mom. As you can see, her boy infant, Imurude, uh, was allowed to turn her head into a playground at any time. So if you go to the next slide, you may wonder, how do we actually measure maternal care? So one of the key measures is nursing time. So how long does a mother provide milk to uh, her offspring? And normally moms nurse their offspring for a few minutes, every two to four hours, a bit like in humans, but this can vary enormously. Um, the day I took the photo on the right, uh, Mudakama nursed her offspring, Akahoso, three out of four observation hours. Um, this was a very special and happy day for us because Akahoso just got reunioned with his mother after he was separated from her for almost a month after their group accidentally split into two subgroups um, after a very surprising and violent interaction with a solitary male. You go to the next. And on average, moms wean their offspring after three uh, and a half years, but uh, it can be as early as two years or as late as five years. With the record holder seeing here, this is Naimana with her first offspring, Corinda. We go to the next. And one other measure for maternal investment is grooming. So how long does a mom groom her offspring? As you can see, moms can have very different styles to do that. But one thing is always the same, just infants dislike being groomed because they are busy, they have much more exciting things to do like playing. And I bet this sounds familiar to many of you. you go certainly, to certainly sounds familiar to me as a mother of two girls with long hair, that is for sure. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> They're luckily not so long their hair, but a lot of hair. <laughs> And um, another measure I like to introduce is transport. Um, so moms can carry their offspring on a bag in ver various different styles. If you go to the next, you can see here a very experienced mom, it's Umusatsi, and she has her uh, 2.5 month old boy, so very young on the back, which is very rare to observe because usually at such young age, mothers usually carry uh, their offspring much more protected uh, with one arm on their chest. So that was a rare observation. If you go to the next, and if you have wondered how a gorilla mom handles twins, then that photo is for you. It's pretty astonishing. All right, and a final measure for uh, maternal investment I would like to introduce is proximity between mother and offspring, which is a reflection of um, protection. So with time, usually moms tolerate their youngsters less in close proximity especially during feeding sessions, as you can see on the right photo. All right. Great, Winnie. Well, you know, when I hear you talk, I think of two things. One is that you probably had like the most, the best PhD of anyone in the world because you got to spend it all watching adorable gorilla babies. So I think a lot of people are very jealous of you. Um, the second thing is that it really shows the incredibly important role of moms and that, that super tight bond between moms and their infants. I often tell the story that when I had my own kids, I brought pictures of gorilla moms and their babies to the hospital with me because I was like, if I can be half the mom that a gorilla mom is, I will be an incredible mom. And we can see that through these photos. But that leads the question to what happens if an infant loses its mom? So we know that if an infant loses its mom before it can really eat on its own. So you mentioned two years is kind of the cutoff when they can be weaned, those infants won't survive. But what if you lose your mom after that age? So you can eat enough to maintain your body weight and, and grow, but, but you don't have your mom there with you. And so that's a, a topic that we recently looked into and Robin led that study. I'm gonna let her talk to us a little bit about it. Yeah, so exactly that. I mean, as Winnie laid out, these mothers are so important. And we know that in a lot of other primate species, 
when young young infants lose their mothers, they, they're much less likely to survive and they're much less likely to be able to have offspring of their own. And so we wanted to study this in gorillas too. And we have now with kind of 53 years of data, we can finally look at this because we have to look across whole gorillas lifetimes to understand it. Um, but actually what we found when we examined all of this long-term data is that the gorillas that, were, that lost their mothers were actually doing just as well as those that didn't, right? They were just as likely to survive. They were just as able to kind of reproduce and form groups of their own. Um, and it really goes against what we see in a lot of other species. And we wanted to understand why this is, right? Why, why are they doing so well? And we think a lot of this comes down to the gorilla groups and all of the social support that they get in those groups. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we can see this one here is a video of you might think it's a mother and, and their infant, but it's actually not. It's just another group member looking after this, this um, young gorilla here and displaying a lot of kind of very maternal looking behaviors. And we see that there, there's a lot of interactions between a lot of different group members um, with these orphans. So what we did in the study is we looked at kind of before they lost their mothers and after they lost their mothers. And we looked at what happened to all of their social relationships in these groups. What we found is that they really strengthened their relationships with all the other group members. They spent much more time in proximity to other group members and also much more time in physical contact with them. Um, and what we found, the people we found, the people, the gorillas <laughs> we found were really important were, were the dominant silverback males. So you can see here um, one of the dominant males looking after an infant there. And they're, they're so important, it looks like, in when when orphans lose their mothers, it seems that the dominant male really takes on a lot of that responsibility. Um, so we've got reports from the fields of, of infants kind of sharing nests with the dominant male if they haven't got their mother. And just they spend a lot more time in proximity. And we think that this might be one of the reasons why they're actually doing so well, even when they do lose their mothers, because they have so many other group members to rely on and so much support coming from, coming from these other gorillas that they get to hang out with. Um, which was a really nice, um, really nice finding um, and really interesting in, in comparison to what we see in humans. Yeah, I think that that's one, you know, when, when we looked at, we were, we were not that surprised at this data, right, Robin, because we kind of know from watching these guys in the field um, that these infants are able to survive. And this is in really big contrast to say chimpanzees, their closest relative, where if a male loses its mother, even up to the age of, I think roughly 13 to 15, so well into adulthood, that they have lower survivorship, they have shortened lifespans, females will have delays to their, uh, to reproduction, so they reproduce later than if their mom was alive. So really huge repercussions for these individuals. Whereas for the gorillas, because they're so awesome, um, this isn't the case. And as we've talked about, you know, when we, we talk about gorillas is that it's a really interesting model, say for human societies. And I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I think, so what we find in humans is that it really varies, right? And some societies, uh, uh, orphans do just as well as non-orphans and in others they do much worse and it really varies again kind of who in their in the family group provides support so often in humans grandmothers can be really important and fathers as well and there's a whole number of kind of extended family members that take on a really important role and we call this kind of cooperative care and that's something that's often thought to be kind of fairly unique in humans compared to other apes but actually what our findings suggest is that this is really going on in gorillas too, right? We've got a lot of care from, from other group members, even other females, but not to much, not to such a big extent as, as really the dominant male. And this dominant male isn't even always the father. There's quite a lot of cases we came across where the dominant male isn't the father, but they're still taking on this really big caring responsibility for these young orphans. Yeah, that, that's, I think, a great point. And we actually have a video that I'm going to let you walk us through, Winnie, here, and tell us what we're seeing in this video. Mm -hmm. So here we join Isabu Kuro group for breakfast. This crew became a refuge for orphans due to multiple events that struck this group. So when the video was taken, the group counted 12 gorillas, of which 11 were orphans at the time, between two and a half and 10 years. And um, within only one year, the, uh, the seven youngest orphans, of which six you can see on the video, lost not only their mother, but also their father, Isabukuru, who was the former leader of this group when he died in 2017. So overnight, Kuba, who you can see here on the video, the former second ranking male, and now the new leader of the group, had to take over not only the protection of the whole crew, but also the role of the mother and the father for these orphans. 
it was really very touching to see how quickly Kubaha adopted his new role and the strong support these orphans also provided to each other during this really incredibly hard and uh, challenging days. Thanks, Winnie. Yeah, it is, it is amazing. And again, the fact that he's not their dad and took on this role, it's, it's just phenomenal. And I think it's one of the reasons that we all love gorillas so much is this incredible family structure that we see in them that, like Robin mentioned, does mirror ours in some ways. Um, a lot of the work that we've been talking about up to now uses kind of the traditional methodologies that Diane Fossey first started, you know, back in the 60s, which is observing individual gorillas who were known and just collecting basic data on their behavior. So sitting there with a, a pencil and paper, or now we use iPads and recording all the things that the gorillas do. But luckily, we technology is helping us um, answer new questions about the gorillas and use new methodologies for studying them. And so I just wanted us to talk a little bit about that. So this is Nadia, she is one of our research assistants and she is there with kind of a sophisticated jerry-rigged camera that we use to do types of studies that we call photogrammetry. So these are studies where we're actually taking photos of gorillas in the field and then using those images to um, determine how big the gorillas are. Because if you can, if you think about it, there's no way to really measure a gorilla. You can't walk up to them with like a measuring tape and see how big they are. But with this camera, what we do is there's actually these um, parallel lasers that are projected onto the gorilla. You can see them here. And they are a known distance apart, no matter how far away you are from the gorillas, we know exactly how far apart those dots are. And so when we get a photo, what we can do is go back into the lab and then use those dots as kind of a reference point to go ahead and measure things like their back size, their arm length, um, their overall body size. So you can see here all these different measurements that have been done. And when we measure gorillas of different ages, and then over time, the same gorilla multiple times, we can come up with this growth chart. I promise this is the only science chart we're gonna to show today, um, but I find it really fascinating. It's kind of like a growth chart that you would see for humans. And so all these little dots either represent different gorillas or maybe the same gorilla that was measured multiple times during its life. And what you can see here that was fascinating to us and accounts for some of the confusion we sometimes have when we're sexing gorillas is that the male female line completely overlaps until about the age of eight. And then you can see males really continue to grow at a very high rate and they peak out at around 15, they reach adult size. This is the female growth chart. And so you can see that they sort of really slow down. They reach adult size at about 12. And so this is their chart. So that was one thing that was fascinating to us. And, you know, sometimes we'll have, we've, we've known gorillas that we thought was a male and then suddenly or at age 12, 13, they're not really growing. And we realize actually this is a female. Um, the other thing that's really fascinating from this chart that we've been able to look at is you see these dots vary a lot. So there are some dots that are way above the line, some dots are below, meaning that some individuals are bigger than normal and some are low. And we see that smaller than normal and we see that for both males and females and we've been able to do some really interesting studies to see well what's the effect of that so combining the size data with our data on dominance and reproduction and we find very different stories for males and females so over here on the left you see Mafunzo. he is one of the biggest males that we've studied and what we've been able to show is that bigger is certainly better for male gorillas. So Mufunzo is um, has been very successful. He has he's put together quite a large group and has a number of offspring. So we found that larger males uh, are more likely to become dominant, are more likely to attract females, and also more likely they have higher reproductive success. But that isn't the case at all for females. So on the left here, you see fat. Um, you can't quite see, but she's here, I believe, with three of her offspring. She is a very average size female, but she's highly dominant. And she managed to have three kids in the time that it takes an average gorilla female, uh, in, in half the time it takes an average gorilla female. So on average, gorillas have gorilla females have babies every four years. So it would take them 12 years to have three kids. It took her six. Um, but again, she's not, bigger isn't necessarily better in females. It's really dominance that matters more than your size. So that was one really, a couple of really interesting studies that we've published recently. Another one that just came out earlier this year, we took that size data and then we um, did some recordings of a very iconic gorilla vocalization uh, communication style, which is the chest beat, what you see right behind me over my shoulder. So this is Eric, another one of our research assistants. He's recording chest beats. Um, and what we were able to find is that larger males actually have lower frequency chest beats. 
And why this is important is that it means that the chest beat, which can be heard for up to a kilometer away, can be a really useful tool for gorillas to gain information about other gorillas in the area without actually having to meet up with them. So potential rival males might be able to tell something about the size of a male by the sound of his chest beat. And also females might be able to tell something about a potential mate from the, from the sound of the chest beat. So this was a really fun and interesting study that got a lot, lot of popular press. Again, I think because it's associated with this very iconic uh, guerrilla com communication style. So that's one set of studies we've been doing. Another set relates to um, one of our favorite topics, and I know it's lunchtime for many of you, so I apologize in advance, but how do you know what's going on inside a gorilla? Everything we've kind of talked about is outside, but if we wanna understand what's happening inside, um, whether it be genetics or physiology or health, um, we really need to get what we call poop sample, what are poop samples? Um, so this is a huge area of research for us and Winnie's gonna talk to us a lot about it. But first I, we put a little video together so that you can understand kind of what it takes to go from watching a gorilla to knowing what's happening on the inside. And I'm gonna let Winnie walk us through this. All right, so gorillas feed a lot a day, 60 pounds about. And that makes them actually very generous uh, poop donors. So here you can see them feeding on herbs. And after they dropped their dung, our um, trackers, our rangers, gonna pick a subsample with cloths and they label the samples with the gorilla name, the collection date, and time. And then they store them in a pooling bag. In the end of a gorilla visit, our rangers then carry those samples out of the park. And that can be a very long way. And there are our Poop Express motors waiting to transport those samples to our lab in Musanze, which is about 45 minutes away. And once he arrives at the office, which you can see here, Rose, our lab coordinator, takes over the samples. And she writes down all the information about each sample in the logbook and freezes those samples until she extracts the hormones. For that, she has to defreeze them again. And uh, overall, that process really needs a very skilled hand like Rose. And, and one of the first steps is to uh, remove 1.5 gram of feces from the subsample by avoiding fiber and undigested berries, for example. Then we add ethanol to each sample and we mix the, this mixture with a homogenizer after the sample is poured through a funnel-shaped filter paper, as you can see. And the solution then runs into the tube and that's where we have our hormones. And after the ethanol has been evaporated, we can cut the tube with our hormones ready to be shipped to uh, our partner labs in the US. Thanks, Winnie. Yeah, so it's an incredibly detailed process. And one of the things we're, we're really excited about with our new home is that the labs will be, it won't be that 45 minute moto taxi drive. Our labs will be right up there near the office. And we're very excited. I know Winnie is thrilled to have a purpose designed lab for this kind of work where we're not using a modified old kitchen to do these kind of analyses. Uh, Winnie alluded to the hormone work, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, but I just wanted to talk a bit about the genetic work that we do. So mountain gorillas of the four types of gorillas, mountain gorillas are the only ones that regularly live in multi-male groups. So about 40% of the groups will have multiple adult males in them. And so what this means is that paternity is not known. So in the, the groups that Robin study, there's generally one adult male, so you know who has sired all the offspring. But for mountain gorillas, that is not the case. And so we use fecal samples to actually do paternity work. So these are a number of kids that actually elucidated to us some interesting findings about mountain gorillas. So Remwa over here was uh, sired by Gicharase and that was a decade before Gicharase became dominant. Um, this individual here was sired by Isabakuru when his brother Kansby was actually do dominant. Umaganda, who you see here, was sired by Chibuki, and this is when Chibuki was the seventh ranking male in Shindus group, so quite low on the dominance hierarchy. Um, down here we have Iggy Hozo, who was sired by Vuba. Vuba is, holds the record for being the youngest male to sire an offspring at the age of nine. You remember me saying earlier, we know that these males are not fully grown till 15, but at nine he sired this offspring. 
And then this last one here, um, one of our favorites, this is Taina. So she was sire, she was the last infant sire by the famous Titus. And that was seven years before he died. So we would not have guessed that a male would remain dominant, but not reproduce for such a long period of time, likely because younger males in his group were reproducing. So this really showed us that the dominant male does, you know, it, it showed us the dominant male does not control reproduction. And for these younger males who stay in the group, they really might have the opportunity to sire offspring, even if they're quite low ranking. So very fun kind of, and the group is always guessing like who's the dominant male? I mean, who's the sire of this offspring? Can you tell from relationships that you see the female have with different males in the group? But now I wanna turn it back to Winnie, who's really kind of our poop expert. We call her Winnie the Pooh, um, cause she will tell us a little bit more about some of the other work that we're doing with fecal samples to, to help us better understand and conserve the gorillas. Absolutely. Um, I won't hide that passion for poop. And <laughs> just simply, as uh, Tara said, it's really amazing how much information we can gain from uh, these gorillas uh, when we uh, look at these fecal samples, which we just cannot capture with our naked eye. If you go to the next slide, um, I just want to show that it's not just me. There's a big fan club of uh, yeah, who also just like poop and uh, uh, follow my steps and um, what you can see here on the right side, those are two biology students who weigh poop samples and they want to better understand soil contamination with intestinal parasites, which um, are dropping, they are dropped in the poop into the environment and then go into the soil. And what they found out during the study is that the whole population, the Virunga population, which counts about 600 gorillas, poops every day 1.35 tons of uh, poop. So that was quite an amazing number to come up with. And um, what Tara mentioned earlier on, one of our probably most popular study we do with fecal samples is looking at stress physiology in the gorillas. So the end product of a long stress uh, reaction in our bodies and also gorilla bodies um, are deposited in the poop which we then can measure. So you can imagine in humans, it's easy. We take a blood sample and we can measure it easily, but that's not an option in the wild gorillas. So the poop really helps us to uh, uh, get a handle on this. If you go to the next. So in total, since 2011, when we started the study, we have collected over 16, thousand samples so it's a massive amount and uh, these samples now help us to understand different stressors which these gorillas uh, face such as fights between gorillas also between uh, uh, gorilla groups so when two groups uh, meet each other that can be uh, very stressful and we also look at the impact of human presence um, the park is surrounded by a very dense and poor human population, which in part still depends on forest resources. Here you can see um, at the dry season, the foot of the dry season, when people go in the, into the forest to fetch water. And there's still poachers who set snares, mainly for antelopes and so not for gorillas, but they can just also get caught uh, accidentally in uh, these snares, which often requires veterinary interventions to remove the snare. So all of these can be uh, uh, enormous stressors which we want to understand better. And uh, another source of stress we want to look at is ex uh, extreme weather conditions. So such as very cold and misty rainy periods, but also very long dry and hot periods, which could intensify uh, with climate change. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Winnie. And I know we always kind of laugh when we bring up gorilla poop, but I hope that you get a sense of really the incredibly valuable information that we can gain from it. Um, a, without bothering the gorillas at all, and B, particularly because we're collecting it from known individuals. So we can relate that, what those samples back to individuals that we know and what they've experienced. Were they in a fight? Did they come out of the park, et cetera? Uh, Winnie talked about the fact that these intergroup encounters can be incredibly stressful. And in fact, we've seen up to an eight times increase in stress levels after groups come together. So we know this is a really dramatic time in a gorilla's life, but it doesn't always have to be that way. We also see groups that come together that don't um, fight with each other. And so this has been a topic of a study that again, Robin recently led. And so Robin, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk a bit about this. Yeah, so it's one of the really unusual things about gorillas is that they have such a diverse range of kind of encounter types, right? So they can be really aggressive. We've seen things that are kind of uh, 
can even lead to the death of, of some of the dominant males, but they can also be really, really affiliative and really peaceful when they interact. So one of us, a few of our studies have actually been looking at trying to understand why they're really affiliative in some situations and really aggressive in others. Um, and one of the things we found that's really important is actually the relationships between these groups and their past history. Um, so we've got a little um, animation to talk you through. Um, when, when gorillas live in quite large groups, sometimes these will fission. So they'll split apart and those groups will then become independent. But that means that they have all of this kind of shared knowledge of, and relationships from living together. And when they encounter each other again, they tend to be much more affiliative towards each other. And they can even intermingle quite peacefully. Whereas groups that haven't split from each other in the past are much more likely to be aggressive. So it really depends on the history of these groups in terms of how they interact. But on top of this, we found it was even more complicated because each gorilla group has their home range and they have a core that they spend a lot of time in and they sometimes travel into the peripheries and even outside their home range. And how they interact with other groups depends on where they are in their home range um, and also their relationship. So if they interact with a group that they haven't split from in the past, in the peripheries, they're likely to be aggressive. And also in the core, they're likely to be aggressive. So they seem to be kind of defending the whole of their home range against these groups that they're not very familiar with. But when they encounter a group that they've split from in, a, in the past, they have a much more friendly relationship and they're able to actually intermingle with each other in the peripheries. But then if they come all the way into the core, that's when they seem to be more likely to be aggressive. So it's quite relatable, right? We think it's a little bit like humans in the way that they have their own space and their relationship with other groups or other individuals depends, um, really influences how they, how they share their space with them. And so we can think of it similarly to the way that we share our homes, right? So if a stranger turns up in your house, it doesn't really matter where they are, you're gonna be quite annoyed and surprised and maybe even aggressive like the gorillas sometimes are. Um, but if it's somebody that you know, maybe you've invited them over for dinner, you'll be very tolerant of them, uh, especially maybe in your living room, in your dining room, but if they snuck upstairs and started going through your bedroom, you might think that was a little bit weird and you might get annoyed at that stage. So just like us, their relationships really depend and there's, there's a limit to how willing they are to share their space, even with their close friends or their, their groups that they've split from in the past. Fabulous, Robin. I love that um, interactive so much. I think it really helps describe that because it's complicated, but it is like a you said- going on. Yeah, it is so much like us. Uh, when you use the house analogy, it makes so much sense. Um, well, I just before we sort of get to our last topic, I just want to highlight a couple things. I think the what we've talked about today, it really, to me, emphasizes the importance of long-term data. There are very few sites in the world, and certainly very few, uh, if any, gorilla sites, where these types of questions can be answered because they depend so much on long-term data that we've been collecting forever. And so people always say to me like, oh, you've studied the gorillas for more than 50 years. What do you still have to learn? And hopefully you've seen most of the studies we talked about today are things we've just done in the last six to eight months. So really we're learning new stuff about the gorillas all the time. And then the other thing is really the importance of these studies to conservation as a whole. So understanding how gorillas use space and how they interact with each other is really important for understanding how much habitat they might need in the future as the population grows. Knowing what stresses the gorillas is really important for understanding what implications that may have for future population growth and how we might need to do interventions to, um, to protect them from those stressors and how things like climate change might really have an impact. Um, the last thing I just want to mention too is that we talked all about gorillas today, but they are just one area of focus for us research wise. We obviously study the whole biodiversity of the region and these are just a few of the animals that our, our biodiversity team focuses on. And what's really critical about this work is that by studying these animals, they really help us understand the health of the overall habitat for the gorillas. So biodiversity research is just as important as gorilla research. We, we just didn't have time to get to it today. The last thing we're gonna talk about is the fact that we also study people. So you may know that one of our four pillars is training the next generation of conservationists. So we, since the early 2000s, have been very invested in working with universities in Rwanda to help prepare the next generation of African and Rwandan conservationists for the challenges of the future. And we actually just published a paper on this, sort of documenting the methodology and trying to use it kind of as a roadmap for other conservation projects to show how beneficial it has been for the students that have participated. And what I wanna ask Winnie to do is kind of just walk through what we do with these students when they come 
um, to work with us, in particular when they do their senior thesis work with us. Mm -hmm. Sure. So yes, over a period of 18 months, we closely supervise 10 to 12 Rwandan biology students from the University of Rwanda. And we guide them through their first research experience and teach them some key scientific skills. We go to the next. So that also includes um, intense teaching. So we give them training in how to design, how to conduct, present, and also publish research projects. In addition to uh, lectures they already get at their university. Go to the next. It's also very important because each of these projects the students work on are very different. And so one-on-one -on -one sessions are very important belong to this process. We go to the next, and that is really the fun part. Every student looks forward to um, once the research is designed and finalized, we take the students into the field. And for some, it's actually the first experience uh, really in the field. And we call it data, um, they their data for four to eight weeks. And uh, in the beginning, they're trained by fossil fund researchers and the field. And we have really covered various top uh, since 2003. So for example, animal behavior topics, um, wildlife conflict, but also plant and socioeconomic research has been covered. If you go to the next, next and 18 months, once a year, students share the findings without. Uh, Winnie, we're losing your audio a little bit, so I'm just going to jump in. I hope I don't know if it's just me or not, um, but we, I think we've lost Winnie's audio. So what Winnie was saying is that when they finish up this study after the 18 months, they then give a presentation to partners in the region. So here we've got our partners like Gorilla Doctors and the Rwandan government and park authorities, all who come to hear these students give their presentation they get a certificate um, for their work. And I really want to emphasize the role, important role that Winnie has played in this, but also a number of external partners. So you'll see here a number of individuals from Cleveland Metro Park Zoo who come and actually work with the students as well as from Georgia College. So they come and they give lectures and they act as mentors to the students because our scientific team is not big enough to do it all on our own. And then the wonderful thing at the end product is that these students are now publishing these papers in scientific journals. So Laban was the very first student. He did a study of the hygienia trees, which are like an iconic tree in the gorilla's habitat. And then Marie Fidel, both Laban and Marie Fidel work for us now. She actually did a publication recently looking at how we can use poop again to understand what animals in the forests are eating. Winnie, do we have you back? Uh, I think. Maybe we don't yet. Um, so just wanted to end by saying that we know, and maybe I'll leave it on this page for one sec, we know that this experience makes such a difference that more than 80% of these students that work with us for their senior thesis end up going into fields in conservation and science. They work all over the country of Rwanda. They're going to get advanced degrees in conservation and science. So it really is a great opportunity to build the next generation. And this right here is one of the, our best and favorite examples. This is Deo. So Deo was one of the very first students who came to work with us. He, we then hired him to actually develop our biodiversity program. He uh, went and got a master's. We supported him to get a master's in Cape Town. He then came back and now is about to finish up his PhD on golden monkeys. Winnie is one of his PhD advisors. And he actually now leads all of the training work that we do with young Rwandans. So he leads this capacity building program that he used to be part of. And this is him giving a presentation, I think back in 2007, on some of his golden monkey research. And I was evidently a juror of the, the poster. So here I am judging his, his presentation. But we're incredibly proud of this work. And again, the importance of getting this information out in scientific journals so others can benefit from it as well. The one other thing I did want to add here is uh, I'm just going to flip back to this photo. You can see this is currently our one and only classroom that we have. And Winnie, who is meeting with the students here, is meeting in the hallway. So one of the wonderful things about our new campus is that we'll have a lot more space for, uh, for this type of incredibly important work to happen. And with that, I wanted to say thank you so much for your time. I am going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to go to questions. So hopefully we had you uh, send in some questions. We had some coming in from advance. And so I'm going to go ahead and start. I've had 
Meg and Hammy some here. So a question we had from Liz is, um, I'll direct this to you, Winnie, is how frequently do gorillas have twins? Up, oh, you're on mute, Winnie. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> that is a very, it's a very good question. In fact, it's a very rare event in the gorillas. So over a period of 35 years uh, in the, the groups we monitor, we only have observed two cases. Unfortunately, none of the twins survived. It's an extreme challenge for a mother to raise twins. But we know of other twins in the population in uh, the Volcanoes National Park, which have survived. Great. And, if, you know, how many um, infants would you say a female can have in general in her lifetime? Winning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if everything goes well, they start reproducing between eight and 12 years. And then every four years, they can get a an offspring. And if a female reaches uh, the age of 35, 40 years, we could, she could get up to eight, uh, nine surviving offspring. But usually it's a bit less. Yeah. Fabulous. Uh, Robin, I just saw the question pop up. Why are there so many orphans? So maybe you want to speak to what our definition of orphaning was. Yes. Yeah, so in our study, we actually had, I think, 59 orphaned gorillas since uh, 1967, when the research was first started. So it's slightly more than one a year, but we actually included not just um, uh, offspring whose mothers had died, but also those whose mothers had transferred to another group. So they don't tend to do this when they have quite young offspring, but they do sometimes do it, right? And so they'll leave their offspring behind in a group and go to another group. And we think maybe one reason why this is so common is actually because those offspring do perfectly well, right? So if, if the, the donor male can, can step in and kind of look after them, then it's not so detrimental to, to those, um, those orphaned gorillas and to the mother's kind of reproductive success as well. But it is still quite a rare event. So it's taken us all of this time to kind of have a large enough sample to, to really investigate this. Great. Great. Um, we have a question about the gorillas. Um, Sage and Doug, have been, who follow us closely on social, notice that a lot of the gorillas have been ranging quite high uh, up uh, near the Visoki Crater Lake. And Winnie, do you want to talk a bit about their, their question is sort of why would they do that? Is it, um, or why are they going so high? Is it food? Is it safety? Or is it just a great view? Yes, yes. Um, maybe here just to start with, uh, the gorillas have always been also ranging very high in altitude, but what we see is they do it much uh, longer periods. And what we think explains is that um, we have a much higher group density in the area we are walking in, where we had previously just three groups, we can have up to 10, 12 uh, gorilla groups. So there is much less space and to really optimally use the space they have available, they um, try to avoid each other, which is uh, often a good idea because as we have learned during our webinar, interactions can be quite dangerous and violent. So uh, to avoid each other, one way is to move into higher altitudes and stay there a little longer to avoid other groups and, and have a bit more of a peaceful period up there. And it's very pretty there too. <laughs> it certainly is. Um, we have so many great questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we will try and follow up with you. I want to try and do two more. This one is for Robin. Um, you know, we, we talked about the group splitting and coming back together. How long do those relationships last? Like, I mean, is it, do they split and do they tolerate each other for a month, a year? What do, what do we find from the data? Yeah, that was actually a really exciting part of, of the study we did is that we looked at groups that had split even 10 years earlier. And we were finding that they were still much more likely to be kind of friendly towards each other. So we think that these are really kind of really long-term social relationships. And this is quite unusual in, in anything outside humans, right? That they have these relationships with individuals that they're not regularly interacting with, but they can maintain them over decades, it looks like. Um, so we've not yet studied it long enough to know when it's when they stop being friends, right? So it'll be really interesting to see if kind of after a generation or two, it's it kind of they become less friendly, but we don't know yet. And I think it'll be really interesting to find out. But we do know more than 10 years, 
And it's interesting because a lot of that may be passed on socially, like, because again, the group members change. So they're learning from watching other group members that this is a group we tolerate. Um, one quick last question from Lee, is dominance passed on genetically? Do dominant males tend to produce more dominant offspring? It's a great question. And it's really difficult to tease that kind of information apart because um, you need a lot of data. I would say that we definitely have seen lines of gorillas that are incredibly successful. So Effie's line, um, she's had a number of successful males. So Kansby was in her line, Isabakuru, Mufunzu. Um, but whether it's genetics or whether it's, you know, they have better access to resources that make them bigger and stronger, that we haven't been able to tease apart. I think we'll need some more data to be able to do that. But it's a really great question. And we definitely see differences between family lines and how successful they are. But whether it's genetics or environment, you know, we don't know. The same as in humans. But Anyway, I really want to thank Robin and Winnie for your time today. Uh, I could talk about gorillas and gorilla research all the time. Um, so it was great to be with you both. I wish you well. And I want to thank everyone for joining us, for giving us an hour of your time. Again, we had a lot of great questions come in. So we'll try and get back to you with some answers on those. We will be doing another webinar. I think we may have one scheduled for September. So I hope you will join us then. Thank you all very well. Stay well. And, and again, thank you for your support of the Bossy Fund. <laughs>